Hey everybody, thanks for hopping on again. We'll get rolling here in just a minute. Can you guys hear that airplane going over my office right now? Yeah. <laughs> so I live right by an airstrip. Well, kind of close. It's behind me. And um, which is a small little regional airstrip, you know. So pretty regular planes flying over. Yeah, we're um not too far from like the Tennessee Air National Guard and they like to play in the valley out here. Mm -hmm. So I'm always seeing some really fun looking stuff out here, but uh, yeah. it's also kind of disturbing. Like it's like, what yeah. is that? And you run outside and there's some big monster like C-130 going over or something. Yeah. Like that. Same thing here. I got the depot close, then Avon pretty close. All our listeners yeah. know once I'm not talking about a uh, home <laughs> or um, <laughs> um, skincare products. Uh, <laughs> So, Could be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's actually, uh, I guess it's a military aviation repair is primarily yeah, what they do what there. Is, yeah. yeah. So we see some cool stuff flying around. All right, I think we'll go ahead and roll. Looks like we got some folks here. Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Hackle Box. It's just me and Pinky today. Uh, Eric uh, is out of office today for some family stuff, and so we get to talk mad junk about Eric again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's the it's the best. I mean. That guy, like, I don't know. I can't. I don't know. I struggle to say anything terrible about Eric. Yeah, it's tough, but we'll do our best. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we always like to talk about something fun, and so Pinky, I got to ask you. And I'm curious what the people think too in our audience. Have you seen like the new Little Debbie ice cream stuff they're doing? I have. I have. Yeah. Um, I'm concerned about our nation, nation's health. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard, I've not tried them, uh, but I've heard really good things about them. So I've tried a couple. Uh, I did try like, a, you know, you get the pints in some of them. And so I tried the oatmeal cream ice cream. Oh yeah. And uh, that's awesome. It's just vanilla ice cream. But it's got like pieces of oatmeal cream pies in there, which is one of my favorites. I think we were talking about little Debbie snacks on here recently. It's kind of funny yeah. continuation of, but the new one, I had no idea this was a thing. Um, actually a comedian you and I both like on YouTube, the guy who does the Waffle House Dojo. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Dojo. Matt, Matt Mitchell. Yeah, yeah. Matt Mitchell. Uh, pretty funny Southerner for folks looking for that type of thing. Um, but he did a, a video last week where they dropped the nutty buddy ice cream bar. And, uh, yeah. I don't know if you've seen that, but, uh, I had to brush right down to the grocery store and, uh, get a box of those and they were pretty dope. I mean, I you just can't go wrong, and I don't I don't know how many how many folks have have really dug into the the Nutty Buddy bars or the Nutty bars. The names have changed over the years, but it's mm -hmm. the wafer with the peanut butter and the chocolate, and it's 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 one of the more perfect uh, snack cakes that exists in the world. It's it's awesome. The only problem with them is that you can't um, you can't expose them to even room temperature, or they just oh, immediately yeah. melt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was telling my wife, cause we actually did watch that. And I was laughing about it because I, I think he makes a comment about that somewhere in there. I was like, yeah, I remember in school, I'd throw those in my backpack and then I would forget about them and I would find them like a week later and they would just be completely smashed, completely melted, but they're still delicious. Like it was still really good. Yeah. So the ice cream has to be awesome. Like, I mean, you know what I mean? Like you can, you can go through all that and the ice cream has to still be good. So it's amazing, man. It, it really is good. It's like a peanut butter ice cream in the center, which you know, I love peanut butter ice cream uh but the outside yeah. is uh it's just like a mashed up nutty bar as the shell and it's it's amazing oh man yeah man yeah it's uh yeah i, I did see too the same same guy um I, I guess they made a line of cereals for a little while too and he was trying the oatmeal cream pie uh cereal and i thought he was gonna have to you know need a moment he was he was in heaven man <laughs> and uh, though those are uh some of the some of the best ones uh they're they're so good so yeah, uh, yeah. delicious stuff i, I see I, somebody's I, asking about a strawberry shortcake version i don't know if that exists or not i, I haven't either. uh educated myself with all the versions but i too hope that is in existence yeah. i'll make a promise to everybody though i will find out and i'll be the guinea pig and i'll try that out before we talk again next month doing the, so. doing the important stuff yeah mm -hmm. the uh um yeah yeah it's they're so good I, and i you know i think you know this uh any other fellow southerners on here it may not just be a southern thing i don't know but it's it's folks that i know of around here as far as i'm aware you can't actually go catfishing and catch catfish if you don't have um, the fudge strap the zebra cakes 
Uh, yeah, you're talking that's about. right. Yeah, they know yeah, what you're eating. They uh, smell it on your fingers when you're yeah, taking fudge it. rounds. That's what they call them, fudge mm-hmm. rounds. Yeah, they smell yeah. It on your fingers. Uh, I don't think I've ever caught a catfish without those at least in the bag somewhere. <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh man, fun uh, times! I see, I see. Yeah, Bryce, did you read Bryce's comment about the cinnamon um, rolls? Yeah. But it's chili, chili seasoning, on oh. cinnamon rolls. Well, so it's Cincinnati chili, kind of like that because it's got the cinnamon in it. Uh, no, no, no. I, I maybe, yeah, yeah, I guess it would be. But uh, chili and ice cream to me. That's oh, totally I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, he's I, talking about chili, that, cinnamon yeah. roll, ice cream. Um. He said it was interesting. I would, I would like to try it. Just have a bite to see if it is. Uh, oh, I think this may be chili, as in hot pepper chili. Maybe let us know, like it's a hot pepper ice cream. Uh, it's it runs a chili seasoning. I don't know if that's a chili seasoning, a chili powder, or if that is a chili right. seasoning for like chili starter. But if it's like spicy cinnamon rolls, I can see that. I dig oh that. no, I like it spicy says, sweet. Yeah, it says like chili, chili the soup. Okay, wow. Okay, weird. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, I try it but I don't know how I feel about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Like chili soup. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I did. I did see somebody asking here too, about uh, the, the painting behind me. Um, not new uh, has been there. I think my camera is just slightly positioned different. Um, that is um, a painting that was uh, done for me by Oscar's wife actually. So yeah, uh, it's a pretty, pretty sweet Raven painting. You can't get as much detail on the uh, camera, but uh, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, there's some cool hidden Easter eggs in there, like we've talked about. And yeah, Pinky is a, a Poe fan. Right? I don't think I'm giving any, yeah. anything away here. No, no, it's a so it's that girl and Poe reference there. So, yeah, uh, pretty pretty awesome. Oh man, there's all kinds of good food stuff happening in the chat here, though. Talk about that. there is. <laughs> all right, so we're gonna talk security stuff. <laughs> um, we could talk, uh, you know, snacks, food, booze. Uh, all day long sports fishing but yeah. this is a security show that's why you guys are here so we will do that i do want to say um we want to try out uh, some new stuff with the show and pinky and i and eric and i've been talking about this and um we want to make this more interactive we really love to have these conversations just to kind of get you all going and give us some feedback and thoughts it makes it more fun for us we know you're listening uh but also we'd like to encourage you guys to start throwing questions in the q a uh, if you have any specific security related questions um anything you're wondering about at all and we'll do our best to get through those as we work through the show as well uh, and in the future i think we're tossing around the idea of just doing kind of like a straight up you know call in show format uh, where we could give you guys the opportunity to speak, ask your questions, and we'll answer those questions. Uh, today, we're going to try it out a little bit uh, with the Q&A. So if you have questions, throw them in there. We'll do our best to get to those, try our best to answer those questions, and hopefully give you guys more value uh, with our time here together today. Um, so let's start with uh, talking about DDoS. Uh, I know KillNet was in the news again last week. Um, I think we've talked about KillNet before on here in the past. I'd have to go back and listen to it, but I know they were in the news um october november last year they had some ddos attacks on the united states domestic airline websites it didn't really cause any uh travel outages but they did cause some outages to um domestic airline websites uh, i think they ran some attacks in november against the united states uh, treasury department i believe and then this last week uh, we heard reports seen it in the news again that they were launching similar attacks on united states domestic uh healthcare organizations uh, what do you know about that pink? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and so the ransom one was new on me. I'd have to go back and look at our notes on them. Um, cause everything I was finding about them was that they were purely denial of service, but, uh, maybe. Oh, no, no. Them. If I said ransom, I totally misspoke. Yeah. They're okay. essentially, uh, DDoS as a service. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so, yeah, like Oscar said, it's Killnet. Um, we do know that, um, uh, uh, Epic, the, uh, electronic medical records folks, uh, pretty big. They're one of the, I would say that I guess they're probably the biggest, but they're definitely in the top couple or, or two or three or something like that. Um, did send out a notification to folks saying that, hey, we had some clients that were being targeted by um, denial of service attacks. I think what I saw was 20 uh, out of that group. Um, that's what I'd read about. So, uh, but we do know it's probably not just limited to to Epic uh, folks right there. They're definitely going to target healthcare and uh, as well as the energy sector, things like that. Um, does look to be purely denial of service. It is distributed denial of service, so it's always an important thing when you're talking about uh, denial of service. Standard DOS is just denial of service. Those almost never happen anymore. Um, it's almost always a distributed denial of service, right? So many IPs hitting your uh, your environment and trying to overwhelm those environments and, and keep legitimate traffic away. Um, 
standard denial of service as it used to be uh, was just a little bit too easy to block. You know, it's coming from one IP or a couple of sources, right? It's easy to shut that down. Um, yeah, so these guys look to be kind of a Russian, Russian hacktivist group, right? They've, at least from what I've heard, they sort of stated that this is a, in response to the U.S. sending uh, tanks to Ukraine, uh, things like that. And so they just go after people like that. But they've been at it at least since the beginning of the Ukraine-Russia uh, issues. Um, so about 12 months. Um, like I said, it does look to be purely denial of service at the moment. Um, one thing for you know the defense side of it, right, is uh, look into things like web application firewalls, um, services like Cloudflare and you know their competitors uh, to kind of mitigate that, drop that traffic before it ever hits your systems. Things like that are a good way to go. Um, one thing I do always want to mention, though, even though it's probably not the case with KillNet, um, these DDoS attacks uh, sometimes can be used as a distraction technique, right? They're going to pound your um, your public-facing side while they're working an attack on the back end, uh, that, that type of thing. So always keep that in mind whenever you see these. It may not just be a denial surface attack. Um, those are disruptive enough, but uh, always keep that in mind as you're going. Yeah, that was going to be one of my points. It's like you know, I want to talk a little bit about like why why are attackers pivoting more toward DDoS? I think we've seen more DDoS attacks in the news recently than we've seen the, in the you know last three four years. And even we go back a couple of years ago, we started to see that rise. I think as we had the COVID shift, more remote resources, so the folks were likely more susceptible to those public facing resources uh, if they occurred. Uh, an outage. And so trying to think around the logic here, um, you know, why are attackers pivoting to that again? Uh, I think one is yeah, purely a disruption is one option. Uh, but the other option and the bigger one that really spooks me when I think about it is the distraction as well. So if they were showing you this attack up front uh, within our healthcare sector specifically, what were they doing on the back end that maybe we're not aware of yet? Yeah. And, and, you know, and there are some things going on out there with, um, I actually don't think we have it on the topics so and we can probably dig into it if anybody has questions, but, um, uh, you know, there are some, there's kind of a, an active um, VMware uh, attack campaign going on. I think it was something like 3,800 victims, I think mostly in Europe, if I remember correctly, though. Um, and it's an unpatched vulnerability from 2021, so it's part of the reason it's not really on our high level list of news. But um, so think about things like that. You know, do we have other vulnerable systems that are out there? Do we have something exposed that maybe shouldn't be? Um, you know, did this denial of service attack happen? And then, oh, also there's some weird traffic coming from, you know, the accounting department or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. just pay, um, thinking about exfiltration too, right? And I, this may be a point you were going to make, Oscar, so I, don't, I hope I'm not going to um, <laughs> step on your toes there. But when you're distracted by a denial of service attack and you're looking at firewall logs and increased inbound traffic, most people aren't pivoting over to look at increased outbound traffic. So... Mm -hmm you could have that situation where they're hitting you with a denial of service on one end and then shipping data out the back. So keep that in mind as well. Yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And so another thing I want to talk about, this is questions we get a lot. We talk to people when they're experiencing these attacks and um, you know, people are always asking like, what can we do in the moment? Like, Hey, calling the incident response team uh, to come in and try to help stop this DDoS attack as it's occurring. And really, I mean, the logic is just like we talk about instant response planning in general, right? your best way to uh, have a defense against a DDoS attack is by preparing beforehand. And so, I don't know, Pinky, if you want to talk about some of those things that we suggest people do uh, to help uh, thwart these attacks uh, before they start. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so um, getting them before they start is big, right? Because when you're in the moment, it's, it's going to be tough to react to that sometimes. Um, one big one is go ahead and reach out to your service provider, your internet service provider. Who do you work with? What's your ISP? What kind of protections do they offer? Is it something you can add on to your, your monthly bill and it's not that big of a deal? That type of thing. Um, also, you know, like I mentioned, web application firewalls. Um, you get those out in front of your web applications, it gives you a spot to drop that traffic or, or handle that traffic before it makes it to your other systems that are maybe a little more critical. And then things like um, um, sort of along the lines of like the content distribution networks, the CDNs, um, people like Cloudflare. I, I generally go to them because they're kind of the biggest one that everybody knows about. Um, but, you know, they'll host that version of your website or, or host it in multiple places. That way, if one's getting hit, they can kind of shift that around um, and, and help you out there. So if you have some really... Um, 
important service that you that you have that needs to remain public and needs to remain alive you know look into those types of systems to kind of distribute that traffic or have an alternate place to shift the traffic to the legitimate yeah. traffic anyway yeah that's exactly things i was thinking as well like the WAF is the big thing I mean, mm -hmm. try to have the WAF in place beforehand if you can. Uh, the content delivery networks are good. And it's kind of like a pros and cons if you really uh, like study the CDNs and understand how that works, right? I think they're effective at specific pieces of that CDN or that DDoS attack, but it, there's still possibility of a DDoS attack being affected, even if you're utilizing the CDNs, because a lot of case, cases, those CDNs require or rely upon cached versions of your pages, right? So they're yeah. caching that uh, information constantly. And so if the DDoS attack can be more dynamic in the approach, well, they're not able to cache all of those requests. And so all of those requests are still going to hit your backend infrastructure. And if they hit the backend infrastructure, likely going to overload that. And you still could suffer an outage, even if you are utilizing those CDN networks. That being said, though, I do know a lot of the CDN providers provide specific DDoS protection. It's typically like a premium service you would add on as part of your CDN package. So if you're considering that uh, and you're looking at those providers, uh, see what they offer as far as DDoS protections. Like Pinky said, talk to your MSPs, talk to your providers, uh, try to see you know, if you can get those WAFs in place beforehand, and if you're utilizing CDNs, make sure they have adequate DDoS protection as well. Uh, unfortunately, if you don't have these things in place and you call us in the middle of a DDoS attack, there's not a lot that we can do. Um, unfortunately, I wish there was more that we can do. Yeah. Um, you know, we talk about, so, and this is something I'm going to talk a little bit more later, but about blocking IPs, right? And you're just playing whack-a-mole there. I mean, we're looking at, at you know, distributed, distribu a distributed denial of service here. And so it's thousands and thousands of IPs that can be included in this botnet. Those IPs are constantly changing. And so it's not really an effective strategy to block the IPs. Also, the other thing to consider, if you're relying on a, a pure firewall block, uh, well, guess what? So going to overload that firewall, which is going to make the backend systems uh, likely inaccessible because you're going to overutilize that system as well. Yeah, one of the things that I've, and I honestly don't know the effect of, you know, how, how effective this is, <coughs> excuse me. But um, one thing I did mention to some folks when I was talking to him this week is if you are blocking those IPs, because one lucky thing that happened with the KillNet one um, is that it did seem to be a more limited group of IPs. It wasn't quite, at least the majority of the traffic was coming from a more limited group mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, a thousand IPs or something like that. So if you're, if you're in that kind of situation, uh, one thing I do kind of recommend is, is if you can set that firewall to drop that traffic as opposed to blocking it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how effective that is, but I, you know, blocking is going to have a little more processing, um, utils a little more processor utilization on your firewall. Whereas the drop should just say, Hey, it's coming from this IP. I'm not even going to think about it. It's just gone. Mm -hmm. Um, I think with the amounts of data we're working with, it, it may be minuscule, but it's something to try. It's something to, to have, right. you know, if you're in the middle of that. Yep. See, Rob threw a question in here. Uh, would an obvious attack like a DDoS just eliminate the possible surprise of whatever the real attack uh, would be? And yeah, in ways, I think it would um, eliminate that surprise. But also, like I think Pinky was alluding to earlier, uh, it's going to um, add complications to your ability to detect those other attack methods. And the example he gave there was perfect, actually. So if they're launching a DDoS, everybody's focused on that ingress traffic. What if they're turning up a mass C2 that's already in, inside your network and you're not really going to notice those uh, particular traffic or those particular packets as they egress your network. And so it's a diversion mechanism. So sure, you're going to know you're under attack. And a lot of people think it was only the DDoS attack. And so your detection capabilities uh, are going to be um, lower uh, than what they would be if you weren't. Um, you know, we always talk about uh, no normal and find evil, right? So normalizing your environment so you can identify anomalies. Well, in this case, the anomaly is the DDoS. And so it's rather difficult to be able to, um, I guess, differentiate, differentiate the rather small amount of traffic that's utilized by C2 frameworks um, that could be deployed at the same time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think if you want to think about it just in a non-attack terms, right? Like, um, Oscar may giggle at this one because he probably knows what I'm thinking about. Uh, but think about like being in a corporate environment and everything internally is working just fine. Uh, but outbound internet's not working. There's maybe you run through a proxy server or something like that. And that proxy server has to be rebooted once a week and somebody forgot to do it. This is a very specific example for a place that Oscar and I used to work. Um, but uh, 
when that's going on, uh, all of the focus is on whatever's impacting the most people. And so if the DDoS is impacting the most people in your environment or the loudest, you know, the, the, the squeaky wheels, um, you're going to be paying attention to whatever that is. You got to fix that right now. I, if I'm getting 50 other alerts from my, my EDR or my seam tool or whatever, I'm probably ignoring those and I'm solely focusing on the, the, um, the DDoS mitigating that at the, at the moment because it's the most impactful that you can see. And so by the time you get back around to checking out those alerts, the things that happened before, you know, while that was all going on, the attackers could have really done a lot of damage or really spread far and wide in your network and then you've got a much bigger incident. So it does it does raise the alarm level for most folks, um, but it, it also does a really good job of masking some other things that might be going on. Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. So the other point, and I'll share this link, uh, get this out in the notes, I'll make sure our marketing team gets it. Um, but Security Scorecard has released, uh, they have a GitHub page they're managing right now with all known IPs associated with the KillNet proxies. Um, and so, you know, use that as you will. I would, you know, like Anthony put in the chat here, I, I think uh, actually everyone can't see that, but back to what Pinky's talking about, implement your firewall and uh, configure that to block or or to drop uh, those requests if possible. Also, don't think it's a silver bullet because those IPs are changing very regularly and uh, don't, it's just in a static list. It's a very dynamic list. And so just because you implement that doesn't mean you're gonna have protection um, more so like we go back to before having proper DDoS protection. It's about preventative maintenance essentially and, and putting those things in place before the attack actually occurs. Yep, absolutely. Cool. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple articles that Cliff sent to us and Cliff, big shout out, man. I appreciate that. Uh, like I said before, we appreciate feedback and, um, just hearing from you guys, some things you want us to talk about. Um, and this one was interesting to Shane, uh, who's one of our folks, I think is on the call with us, who does our internal security news and is a rock star. So congrats, Shane. You're awesome, man. Um, was just talking about this, uh, recently as well. Um, my notes are. Google downloads are bad, specifically Google ads are bad. And essentially it's just uh, a new take on a malvertising campaign, right? And I think we're seeing an uptick. So a little bit of a backstory here, there's some research done uh, recently um, by security researchers. I don't even remember the group, I can look it up, but anyway, a group did a really good job here, uh, analyzing essentially software downloads uh, that are showing up in your top Google results for ads and discovered that there is a very high volume of malware uh, being served up in these ad campaigns. Um, I don't think this is necessarily something new. I think this has been going on for a while, uh, but at the same time, I think we are seeing the frequency of these attacks increase and likely because a lot of these payloads were historically delivered through phishing campaigns. Um, we're getting better at phishing defense. We're still not great. Uh, I know that Microsoft's getting better, like in the O365 sweep, I default disabling macros. And so it's making it more challenging for our attackers to get those payloads across the wire. And so they're thinking of new creative and effective techniques to deliver those payloads to unsuspecting victims. And the flavor today uh, is through uh, Google ad campaigns, essentially. Yeah, yeah, this one, and yeah, you're right. Um, Shane did, did put this one out there. I think we also have another article uh, that covers some of it because um, early on it was they were really just talking about a couple pieces of malware it looks like it's expanded beyond that at least from what the researchers are finding um, I do think it may have been um, at least Sentinel-1 was digging into it pretty heavily I don't know if they were the original ones who discovered it mm -hmm. but um, yeah and so so the way this works is um, the attackers are essentially buying ad space to appear you know if you think about your Google search results those first two or three are always an advertisement and then below that is your legitimate results that you're looking for. And sometimes, um, let's say you're searching for um, Zoom, because Zoom was one of the ones that was involved in it. Let's say you're looking for the Zoom client um, or um, Notepad++, which I think was probably aimed at a lot of uh, security folks, because, I mean, every security guy has Notepad++. Um, and so you, you do your search for Notepad++. That first link there sometimes will actually be the legitimate Notepad++ download. but Sometimes, and in this case, where the attackers were doing it, they were buying ad space to make it look like that. And the domain may be like, we'll just go back to Zoom. Instead of like zoom.us, it might be zoom-download.xy or something like that. And so most people aren't going to catch that. They're not going to pay attention to that URL and just click it and download it and think they're getting Zoom. 
uh, whereas they're getting malware in this case. And um, looking through some of the malware that, that was being distributed that way, I know I saw Iced ID in there. Iced ID was a, a monster over the last couple of years uh, being used to as a um, kind of a dropper to bring in additional command and control uh, to then do ransomware attacks. Like we saw that in a lot of cases. And so um, some pretty gnarly malware. It's not just your normal adware type stuff that's going to you know, give you bad ads or anything like mm-hmm. that. This is it's, uh, some pretty rough stuff. Yeah, along the list, I think the folks you already mentioned that are being impersonated, also Adobe, which makes sense. Um, Microsoft Teams as well, uh, Slack, Tor, Thunderbird. Um, so this, this, the net is pretty wide. And I guess, too, to clarify, we did say Google. I think we're just using Google like, you know, old people use Xerox as a copy machine. But uh, we really mean any, any search engine ad, right? So I think Cliff had mentioned here, too, they're seeing some action in Bing. Uh, anywhere you can buy that ad space served up through one of our providers and those search engines, you're going to see this attack. And I think this attack is going to continue. It's not going away. Um, really, to it's me, effective. I think it's very, very effective. effective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you think about like, all right, we're having this conversation. Our participants are listening to this. Um, we understand this pretty clearly, pretty simply, I think. But think about the uneducated population, which is the majority of our population when it comes to security controls. They're using this for ease of use, right? The first thing is the best thing. It's going to be the most accurate. So I'm going to download and execute this and not think twice about it. And so uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, victims who don't realize they're victims until um a significant amount of time passes and something more severe happens because of this. Um, really, for me, it's like back to this conversation. We always talk about we present the problem, but the, what can we do about it? And so I think the biggest thing is having the conversation like we're having now, um, making sure that within your organizations and your companies that you are training your end users um, how to spot these attacks um, and the same way you would treat essentially um, phishing attacks, right? No different here. Um, but I would like to ask, I mean, I wonder how many people, uh, you know, in our audience today, like in your, your annual security awareness training, are you including, um, information related to this type of malvertising? And I bet most aren't, um, that's okay. Uh, but I think we have to evolve. We have to grow and continue to, um, change our detection mechanisms and our response mechanisms as our attackers will always continuously evolve, uh, their methods of attack. Yeah, and and yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, while, while we're waiting on people to talk about it here, I know somebody says they do they do train their users not to do that, so it's fantastic. Really glad Good. to say that. Um, but one thing to remember here too is is I know from the 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 nerd side of things, and and I could talk about this because you know we are we are nerd. Um, but from the nerd side of this, right, there's a lot of fancy things you can do with uh, you know like black hole and ad domains and things like that, and and doing some ad blocking and and, and that kind of stuff, and, and all those are great. Um, but what you got to remember is that's probably on your home network. I mean, probably on your corporate network and probably not on your home network. So what happens when they go home and plug into mm-hmm. their home network? Um, they're not getting that kind of blocking. So don't rely on those types of things. Um, definitely yeah, and sometimes I think like those types of mechanisms can even be more detrimental to our opportunity to learn uh, than just properly training people right? Yeah. and exercising education as the first approach for uh, trying to resolve these issues. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's only so much we can do from a technical aspect because there's mm-hmm. the attacks are going to continue to evolve. Yep. Um, everything's going to change. What worked a week ago may not work this week. Mm-hmm. And so keep that in mind. I mean, just like you're talking about with this campaign, right? This evolved out of us being better at detecting phishing emails and even getting users trained to not mess with phishing emails and things like that. So um, just another, another path down that, you know, that sort of arms race between us and the attackers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see a comment from Gwen here, and it's a very good point. We train, but users don't always see the little ad before clicking. And um, that, that's to that same effect, right, uh, is why phishing attacks are still successful as well. Or I know we're all training our users on how to identify uh, a phishing attack and not click that link. But I can tell you from our casework, right, they're still very effective. I think it is getting more difficult for attackers to deliver this type of payload through phishing attacks, um, but that doesn't mean those phishing attacks aren't quite as effective. Yeah, and one, one point I'd make on that too is that, um, and I know we've preached this before, and, and it's something I know that like our BC SO team, they, they preach it a lot, but um, when you have that situation where they don't always see the ad before they clicked it, make sure they feel comfortable reporting that to you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, reach out and say, you know, in this case, you know, hey, hey Gwen, uh, I clicked an ad, uh, thought it was Notepad++. It's 
apparently not. Um, what do I do here? You know, and, and be ready to handle that and handle that with, with some, um, some grace and some, some, uh, some, uh, helpful words of, of encouragement there because everyone's busy, right? We're, we're all doing a lot. You know, we, we were, you know, we're at work, you know, we're getting paid to do things. We're busy. We've got a lot going on. It's, it can be difficult to, to detect that sometimes. And the best thing there is make sure they report it to you quickly so you can take action quickly and you're not finding mm-hmm. out about it when you're ransomed, you know, a week later and, and we're, you know, you've, you've called us and we're tracing it back down. We're like, oh, it's, hey, it's this ad that Oscar clicked on on Tuesday. Uh, turns out that wasn't actually no bad. Plus, plus, it was uh, some some, <laughs> some malware. Yeah, yeah, Rob, Rob probably not the right, uh, yeah. <laughs> not, not, not my favorite uh, uh, mechanism there. So I got to ask a fun question here for you, Pink, and everybody listening to um, when you, you know, do a search and you see the ad result and you know that ad result is actually what you're looking for but I'll, I'll still skip the ad result and yeah. go find what I'm looking for. And the standard results, you do that too. Yeah. I did it one, I did one time where I was like, I looked at the URL and I was like, that's definitely okay. And then yeah. clicked it and even still felt dirty about it. But yeah, yeah. I didn't really yeah. scroll past the ad. Yeah. It's like, I know that's what I'm looking for, but I'm still going to roll on past that for multiple reasons because Google's getting dirty. Google's getting more of my money or our money or someone's money because of that. Number one, uh, number two, we're just finding the problem. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to not give them money as part of it. And not, also, if it's a smaller company that I'm downloading something from, so, um, um, oh man, uh, 7-Zip, right? So 7-Zip is mm-hmm. one that I tend to, down, tend to end up downloading frequently. Um, I pretty much never click that ad because I don't want those guys to have to pay for that ad click. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, because I know they're a small company. But beyond that, so some of those companies like like 7-Zip and some of those smaller ones, I mean, even Notepad++, um, I've gone as far as to go over to like Wikipedia, look at the link there, make sure I'm matching up the correct links, even though that can be edited too, but at least I'm getting two sources right. and then download whatever it is that I'm going to get. Yeah. yeah. Cause a lot of so those the, companies don't have a, a clear company name, right? It's not mm-hmm. like seven zips by some other group. And, and, you know, yeah. and especially when you get into a lot of like niche tools and niche applications that yep. we use as yeah. information security professionals, uh, you got to be careful when you're navigating down that path, even outside of ad space. There's a lot of, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this before. I'm looking for a specific tool and, um, you know, I'll see two or three different gets that are cloned and it's the same tool. And so I got to do some, you know, research to identify who's the proper owner of this GitHub uh, repo and, and validate what I'm getting is actually what I expect to be. Our tools are so shady anyway, most of the time, like a lot of those, those niche tools, it's like, man, um, you know, it's why we have a lab. It's why we do all of our stuff in a lab is because sometimes we can't even trust our tools, you know, fully. So we want to be careful with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the big thing too, for me here is I go back to Google uh, and I know that Google has policies in place and they say they're monitoring for, uh, delivery of malicious content through the ads network. And this has been, they've been very public about this. Um, but it seems to me like my perception is they're doing a poor job today. And now maybe my perception is wrong just because the volume is so high and maybe they are catching 98% of these. I don't know what those statistics are because I don't think they're sharing that data with us today. Um, but it really does beg the question though, when a lot of these, like specifically what we're talking about today, um, you know, I would encourage everybody like do a search right now for Adobe Reader and take that link you see and your ad, don't click it and throw that link in virus total and see if it gets flagged in virus total. And we're seeing a very high hit rate on those returns being flagged in virus total. So it really makes me question Google's efficiency uh, and their focus, right, on being able to uh, properly um, filter these malicious results. And back to the same thing we were talking about before, uh, t- our threat actors are paying Google that same money that our legitimate business owners are paying Google. And so in reality, are they putting the focus that they should on trying to stop this attack? So interesting. I did go download Adobe or uh, Google Adobe Reader. I actually even did Adobe Reader download just to make sure, but um, I'm getting no ads for that. And I'm this is not an ad blocked browser. So that's kind of interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if they've, I wonder if they're, doing some stuff right now to kind of help this. So mm-hmm. it's, 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 it's made news. No, well, their AI model, you know, we we're talking about last week, they're listening to us today and they quickly updated the algorithm to remove Adobe Reader. <laughs> That's, that yeah. said, I did Google another topic from earlier that I was looking at and uh, I have four ads at the top that are almost uh, indistinguishable from the, uh, the legitimate 
um, articles there. So that's, I mean, they're, you just have the two little letters that are add, right? There's no other shading or anything like that. Maybe it's because I'm in dark mode, but mm -hmm. um, it'd be really easy to click that. Yep, yep. Cool. Well, that was fun. Uh, do better, Google. Let's all do better at training our end users. No retribution here. Make sure they feel comfortable in reporting those things. I always love, you know, I, I stole this from you, Pinky, and I use it in a lot of my uh, talks I do, uh, which is about the reward system for people reporting possible security events and something as simple as a candy bar. We all love, we, you know, we love candy bars. We're always talking about candy ice cream, all that good stuff. Um, but literally just any sort of a small token of appreciation to your users for uh, reporting those things can be uh, just a really beneficial in building that culture uh, within your organization, making people feel comfortable when they make a mistake and reporting that information to you. To, to be fair, because uh, uh, mostly because he's on here and watching, uh, I'm pretty sure I stole that from Charles here at Dark okay. Secure. So yeah, so it's just making it down the list. And, and <laughs> My bad, um, Charles. I heard it from Pinky yeah. first. He did not mention you at all. So <laughs> no, no, I did. That's a full credit for that. <laughs> he probably did. I probably forgot. So I'll take full blame. <laughs> Kudos to you, Charles. Thanks, man. <laughs> all right, cool. So we're gonna pivot here and talk about uh, another very interesting story uh, that Cliff shared with us, and um, this was uh, insider threat related. Uh, Ubiquity Networks. Uh, so essentially, recently, a developer pled guilty to hacking his own company uh, and trying to essentially extort money because he had uh, stole data from the company. Um, and he also was on the uh, team that was investigating the incident. Um, I, this is just like, I don't know, it seems like something out of a a story a fantasy world here when i'm reading through this you know and we all always like you know it, it, i will say like as a responder um there have been cases i and i have worked one case in my history that was an insider threat case out of the hundreds of cases i've been involved of one of those cases actually turned out to be an insider threat um, i will say we do have suspicions sometimes we go to a case that there could be insider threat involved um, i will say it's also typically very difficult to prove that insider threat, even if you believe it to be the case, uh, for a whole slew of reasons, which we can get into and probably have a whole uh, other episode or topic based on that. Um, but this is a um, really interesting one. I mean, he literally hacked his own company, stole a bunch of data. Uh, he didn't encrypt anything. He just said, hey, I've got your data and I have like uh, evidence of critical vulnerabilities to access your networks and give me two million bucks or I release your data and publicly disclose those vulnerabilities. He was using a VPN, uh, Surfshark, to mask his home IP and he was actually caught because his home internet went down. The internet came back up before his VPN reconnected. He had a packet that went into the ubiquity networks and it revealed his home address. And so boom, they caught him. Yeah. it's. It's a lot. Um, <laughs> there's so much going on there, yeah. but it's kind of one of those things. Like I, I, I almost can't believe that that was how they caught him. Um, just it's, it's difficult. So it had to have been pretty mm -hmm. um, clear. Uh, and I think when I was reading through that, it was like that that brief bit where he was coming from his home network. He was actually accessing the exfiltrated files, mm -hmm. and so they were able to kind of figure that out. Or I mean something of that effect, or at least the network that was being exfiltrated. And they saw some of that data pass across. Um, yeah, it's pretty wild, and, and I do agree. Um, we do always want to look out for insider threat because it's a very real thing. Um, I know it's a pretty big story a few years ago where there was a, a Tesla employee who reported it, but uh, some Russian attack group had offered him a pretty large amount of money just to take like a USB stick into the office and plug it in. Mm -hmm. um, and so it does happen, even if it's not like a true, like this guy, he was just sort of out to do his own thing. He's kind of freelancing, it sounds like. But even thinking about that, right, um, I mean, definitely some rabbit holes you can go down here, right? But, I mean, if somebody comes to one of your employees and offers them a whole lot of money uh, to do something like that and promises them they're going to get caught, I mean, have some folks that are going to do that. Hopefully not. I mean, but uh, there are some folks out there who, you know, maybe they've got, Big medical bills. I, I don't know what the case is, right? But they've got some some driver to handle that. And uh, it, I agree, it's it's extremely difficult to prove um, a lot of times. 
and it's it's one of those things where there's there's such a high bar for that um, for that attribution to go toward a, an employee that it, it can be difficult. Um, do you always want to look for it and you kind of know um, know know your users a bit? But uh, yeah, this one's wild. I, I was reading through this; I thought this was crazy. Um, a lot of stuff to this too, right? You know, ubiquity. I, I would bet that a bunch of people. Please don't put it in the chat because I don't want to know what your home network setup is. Um, but I would bet that we have a bunch <laughs> of people who are uh, who are using ubiquity gear. It's pretty popular, right? Uh, super easy to use stuff. And uh, um, it they took a big reputational hit over this, if you remember. Oh like yeah, a lot of so, folks using yeah, it. that's another big piece of the story is that so our attacker here, Sharp, who was also the insider. Uh, reached out to Brian Krebs. I'm sure everybody knows who Brian Krebs is. And he was masquerading as a whistleblower from Ubiquity, essentially saying, hey, Ubiquity has a hacker. They acquired root access to our networks. Uh, they exfiltrated a bunch of data. And guess what? The legal team is covering this up and they're not publicly disclosing the breach. And as a result of that, uh, essentially, their stock price fell, plummeted, and they lost about four billion bucks in value instantly because the guy who hacked them was also an employee, whistleblowed that they weren't <laughs> disclosing their incident, and then tanked their stock prices. And then adding on top of that, uh, Krebs got sued because yep. uh, for defamation. They were saying that, and and it was such a strange like timeline of events, right? Like Ubiquity didn't deny. That this was true when it came out, but they also filed a defamation lawsuit against Brian Krebs for disclosing the information publicly, which has been dropped. I think that all got flushed down good. because, uh, I mean, I don't know what grounds they have to stand on for that, but yeah, there's so many. He took the articles to down too. Um, he did, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you know, to his credit, he did that. That probably part of the hey, you drop the suit, I'll drop the articles kind of thing. But, and also, uh, but he took his articles down. But all there's a lot of people that just report on what Krebs reports. Those are still right. up. They're still out there. I mean, I was I, looking at him today when I was researching this. I think we talked about it at the time. I think we talked mm -hmm. about the ubiquity issue. If we didn't on here, I, I did somewhere else. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, um, you know, there's a lot to that part of it too, with, with sort of how legal handles these matters and, and boy that's a soapbox i can't get on when we've got an hour um and also would anger all of our lawyer friends who are our friends um we just you know <laughs> sometimes we have disagreements about how things should be handled um but yeah it's 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 just wild uh, the whole the whole story is pretty crazy and um it, it really caused i mean even like for me i like i, I would not have at, at the time would not have recommended people get the ubiquity gear. I'm still not recommending anything because mm -hmm. anything can be as unsafe as you want it to be. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, kind know, of a wild story. That reminds me. Um, so Pinky and I did a CTF together at DEF CON last year, capture mm -hmm. the packet and we got fourth place, which is pretty dope. Uh, but yeah we got gifted a network device. Wasn't that a ubiquity device? And then we have a laugh over that. It's like, nah, I'm not plugging that shit at home. I think so. <laughs> I think it may be, you, you've got it somewhere. It's, yeah, um, it's sitting in my office in a box somewhere. I'll get that out and see. The, the other thing, yeah, it yeah. not only was, I do think it may have been a ubiquity device. If it wasn't, it was, um, it was not Palo Alto, but it's one that has a similar name. I can't remember who that yeah. is. But either way, it was another like cloud managed security device. Mm -hmm. uh, to be fair, um, part of the reason we didn't want to plug it in our network was that we got handed a network device at DEF CON that had been opened. Uh, yeah, it wasn't sealed. It was like, yeah. yeah, it was not sealed. It was not sealed. It had a business card <laughs> in it for the salesperson. And it's just like, hey, so if we have any of those folks out here out there who want to give away something to DEF CON, uh, maybe seal that up. Make it look yeah, really yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> look really secure because no one's going to use that. Uh, yeah we talked about it i was like straight to ebay man we'll just split the money <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and i still haven't put it on ebay because i even had second thoughts about that like i'm not going to yeah. purposely sell someone a device that i'm suspecting could be compromised because you know that's pretty unethical of me uh that being yeah. said we should like have a little uh fun time and plug that device in just to see uh if there's any funny business going on there yeah 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 hang it directly off the internet and do some monitoring that would be that actually would be a good time we should yeah. uh, we should do that but yeah that was yeah, <laughs> that was a. I just had to laugh, and it was, it's so funny. Just here, here's this open network device. Just go home and enjoy that after yeah. you just got done <laughs> with a, a an entire CTF about capturing packets. So cool. Yeah, thanks yeah. guys. I, yeah. I <laughs>
<laughs> well, I get, maybe that's like the training ground, right? So that was, I guess this so, was yeah. like the secret code to the next level and we didn't unlock mm. it because, uh, you know, we proved we can dissect those packets and identify the attacks. Um, but now, like, really, this is like a, you know, top secret mission yeah. that we didn't even embark upon. Well, Damn maybe it. this is how maybe this is how we get better the fourth next year, right? Like, we, yeah. we figure it out what they're doing. Yeah. And uh, go in there. But uh, I, no, no, uh, no hate toward the crew that puts that on, too. They put on a really good CT. Oh, yeah, they're awesome. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, they it's were probably nice. it's probably fine. It's probably yeah. clean. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't trust anybody, especially if you're giving me free stuff at DEF CON. I don't trust you even more. I will say, though, just if they're, they happen to ever listen to this, uh, get better shirts. Um, I don't know about your shirt, Minx, but mine, um, it shrank up. And mm-hmm. as a bigger man, uh, it's yeah. now a belly shirt. And though that might be fun for some folks, it's not a look that I generally rock. Yeah. Um, so it's it's really short now. Yeah. Mine went from an XL to a medium. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. going to be a great summer shirt, you know, because I can, like, wear it as, like, a belly shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. While you're fishing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Oh, oh, oh man. man but so yeah to wrap up the story here about uh sharp who's the attacker for ubiquity uh i think he's facing is it up to 35 years 35 years yep 35 years i mean yeah and i don't have a problem with that just no be clear um, that's a, it gives us all a bad name too right i mean he was one of the investigators on the case and uh mm-hmm. so if you can't trust the people that are investigating your incident then who you know who are you going to trust so I didn't love that. Yep. Do you see we have some questions? So yeah. So the first one from Cliff here. Um, do you have any advice around Pam solutions? Amanda, don't put that image in anybody's head. So I'm sorry. No, just in the chat. Amanda is telling you not to forget a certain type of shorts to go with that shirt, and I was just telling her oh. not to <laughs> not to put that in our heads. <laughs> nah, she's right. I wear my cut off uh, jean <laughs> shorts with my well, belly shirt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey i mean i'm i'm gonna be honest so i'm a hillbilly from kentucky everybody knows that like yeah. if i said i'd have some cut off jean shorts i'm lying i'd be lying to you because you yeah, know you my would, jeans yeah. get holes in them what are you gonna do cut them off and make awesome summer shorts man so they're great for children around the house yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so pam solutions uh priv- privileged access management solutions um you know personally i haven't gave a lot of these tools a spin uh, my general take is like as everything, a solution's only as good as the implementer. Uh, so I really can't give any specifics on any of the different flavors. Uh, but I don't know, Pink, if you have any hands-on uh, and experience you could share with folks. I don't really, but I do think that one good thing is the question is kind of around selecting them. Like, like what should we be looking mm-hmm. for? And and to be fair, I'm kind of in the same boat here. Uh, you know, Oscar and I have both been out of, of that side of, of things for a while. Um, but as with any solution, right, look for reputational stuff um Mm -hmm. you know the gartner things and stuff like that are okay to get you a a a set of things to look at um but look into how it handles um any requests you're making right are those encrypted do they go out to a cloud system is it handling that over an encrypted channel um uh is that a weak encryption is it a strong encryption what kind of authentication is involved there with that process um you know, I, I would lean toward more of an internal system as opposed to a cloud system uh, in most cases just because of that. Um, but then those have some challenges as well, right? You know, what happens when that thing gets ransomed uh, in a ransomware attack and you don't have access to get to anything? Um, look for for um, good recovery ability, right? So recovery ability, not recoverability. Um, in that, you know, if something goes wrong, that it's not handed out proper tokens for the privileged access, that kind of thing. You know, what options do you have from like a recovery key type um, aspect? Um, are those, you know, long, complicated keys or is it something that might be easier to crack for an attacker? Um, just some different things like that. Um, but I do like those systems. I just haven't got to play around with, the whole, with them a whole lot. Um, I really like the idea of the, the privileged access managers. Um, I do know um, you know, I do a lot of our tabletops here and uh, been in some environments where they were utilizing those. And then, you know, realistically, if it was a real attack, there's a spot there where that would have stopped that attack. You know, you're not you're not doing the whole thing where just as an example, you know, shared admin passwords on on workstations, local admin passwords. It's a really common thing that a lot of times you're you can handle with those, those PAM solutions. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff there. It's also way better than what we see a lot of times, which is a spreadsheet full of passwords. 
So, you know, don't, don't do that. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. So that brings up a question and we may talk about this on a future episode. Uh, you mentioned Gartner and I have some strong opinions about Gartner. Um, really though, I'm just going to survey and you guys can shoot us an email uh, and let us know, but are you using Gartner today? And if you are using Gartner, what are your thoughts? Like, how would you rate Gartner? Now I will say like, like, you know, Pink mentioned here, like some of their reviews and ratings and the quadrants and stuff has some useful data in there. Um, but outside of that, with information uh, that is streaming from the uh, machine that is Gartner, I don't call it a machine, uh, have a lot of questions and concerns. And realistically, are they helping our industry or are they damaging to our industry today? Yeah, we'll be interested to hear those thoughts on that. So I know there's some comments in the chat there about it. Yeah. Too, but, uh, um, yeah. 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 Brush nail on the head, pay for the ranking, but also like even folks, actually, I'm not going to get into this. We'll save this. <laughs> it is pay for play. We all agree with that. Uh, but I'm talking even more so about like their, their expert analysis, expert opinions, and we'll unpack that another episode. So I see uh, Bryce, did throw a comment in about uh, chat GPT. I don't think you listened to last month's episode yet, Bryce. Uh, that was the probably, you know, the primary topic we did talk, talk about. Uh, so I would say go back and give that a listen. Uh, <laughs> come back. And if you have more questions surrounding that, I'm more than open to continue to unpack chat, chat GPT with you guys. Um, start there. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Pink. Uh not, I mean, I'll just hit his question because we, we, I think that's our last question that we have in there. So if anybody has any other questions, feel free to throw them in. We've got a few minutes left here. Um, but just kind of elaborate a little bit on what we talked about last week was, um, you know, he, he is looking to block it in his network. Don't really have a problem with that. Um, I, I think from the, I don't have a problem with it, but I also don't know that there's a ton of risk in just accessing it from your network. Right. Um, that looks okay right now. Uh, but where you run into trouble is, in what you're talking about there with, with, um, and I know we didn't read out Bryce's question, but hopefully we can kind of get to it there. Uh, basically around having it build scripts and then also had some, some concerns about blocking it for malicious, malicious potential. Um, the scripts, uh, the script aspect of it, it is really good at that, uh, from what we've seen, but keep in mind that it is in fact pulling chunks of code from like GitHub repositories and things like that. Um, I, I know it's sort of doing its own thing through its AI learning and, and, kicking out its own response but if it happens to find and it's learning because you know these are all these machines are all uh, taught um, through some processes there that are too deep for me to un fully understand as well but um, it's very likely pulling chunks of things from known code that exists out in the world like if you think about stack exchange or something like that you ask a question how do I do x and then they somebody gives you a code block for that um, that's okay in a lot of cases, but just keep in mind that it may be pulling that from something that may be malicious. Maybe it is doing all the things you want it to do, but is it also doing something else? Is there a, a function in there that you don't quite understand um, or shouldn't be there? And so always keep that in mind with those scripts. If you're getting it mm -hmm. to generate a script for you, review that or work with somebody right. who knows that language. Yeah, and what I've seen the biggest risk there is like typically the script format, pretty easy, but it's the dependencies that will automatically be populated in those scripts. And we've talked about that before, making sure that you're using secure dependencies that aren't already compromised. That's a big problem right now in open source in general. Um, I will say too, like, and the big thing for me is like, um, you know, from blocking this within your network, um, while there are opportunities and possibilities for malicious use, there's also a lot of positives too. And so I, we're still learning how that's going to impact, but I know it can be very useful in communication assistance and helping people, you know, draft specific formats for emails, letters, things like that. Um, so there are a lot of positives I think we're going to see from this. And I think that, uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely potential for malicious use, uh, but Pinky hit a really good point there that, uh, so chat GPT, it's essentially the product of all of its endpoints that's in its ecosystem today. And so those endpoints includes those GitHub repositories, these other code snippets uh, that are publicly available today. And so even though this shortens the time uh, for someone to access those data points that could be used for malicious intent, um, it doesn't eliminate that because that those data points already exist somewhere else on the internet in that ecosystem already. So blocking it, could um 
yeah, I'm not sure that I even recommend blocking it at this point. I think that if an attacker is inside your network and they're reaching out to use chat GPT to create custom code while they're on your network, they're probably not a very good attacker anyway. Uh, they're going to be developing that code outside of your network and bringing it in another way or developing that before they get into your network. So I'm not sure blocking it is even something I would recommend at this point. Um, I'm not saying either way. If you want to do that, you feel more comfortable, do that. Um, but just trying to push our thought on this as we continue to think about this evolve and learn more. Yeah, so so first thing, I did not purchase more long-term storage food uh, to put in the cellar uh, now that the AI is uh, becoming sentient. Mm -hmm. um, didn't do that at all. No, I'm joking. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, <laughs> Bryce does mention here, he's thinking a little more like internal threat, right? So if you've got some yeah. goober that wants to do something <laughs> Some bad, goober, that is the yeah, official right. term. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the official term. Yeah. you got some goober <laughs> that wants to do bad, wants to offload some data or something like that. It does increase that potential for them to be able to go out yeah. and find a, um, you know, mechanism. How, how do I use our clone to effectively pull data from elsewhere? Right. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that's, uh, that yeah. is certainly a possibility. I will say this too. I know last week or last month, we talked about some ways to bypass the ethical boundaries, uh, that are programmed into the AI model. Um, I found some more. I'm not going to share yeah. them with everybody. Uh, Exist. If you yeah. are so inclined, research that more. And I think Bross knows what we're talking about, but there's that's one. There are others too. And so have some fun, play with it, and uh, tell us what you're thinking, what you're finding. We appreciate that input, Bross, and uh, everybody else too. So yeah, just yeah. Uh, just drink responsibly with it, you know. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. All right, cool. This has been a fun episode. I appreciate everybody for joining us again. Hopefully this was valuable for you. Um, as always, uh, reach out anytime. Shoot us some questions. Cliff, we really appreciate your content you delivered. Everybody, we appreciate you being here. And um, let us know to an email or chat or however you want to reach us. Um, what you guys think about doing just a purely Q&A episode coming up. Uh, we think that would be a lot of fun. And tell us what you think too in a quick email. Uh, if you guys would enjoy having the opportunity to to speak on the show and ask those questions in front of everybody because we would love that. Um, yeah, otherwise, absolutely. Everybody have a great weekend and we will talk soon. Thanks, guys. Bye, everybody.